So I will be talking about the solid design principles and how we can use them to write better code in PHP and essentially become better developers. Uh, so a little bit of uh, background. My name is Katerina. I am a software engineer and co-founder of uh, Adiva. Adiva is a uh, marketplace for uh, remote working, and we're focused on helping companies scale their teams with uh, remote developers. So working in an environment like this, I've had the chance to work with a variety of companies and projects uh, and be part from both the startup environment and also the enterprise. And they're both very different, but they're similar in the way of you know, working with spaghetti code and trying to, to find your way through messy lines in, in the code base. Uh, apart from that, I advocate for remote work because I've been doing it since the beginning. So it, it's really great and I recommend it to everyone. And I'm volunteering for the local tech communities, also joining initiatives for inclusion, equality, so you can, you can talk to me about it later if, if you're interested in that too. Now, I'd like to start with a short PHP humor. I'm not sure about you, but I hate this. So this is uh, part of a larger comic. Uh, it was published by, by Toggle a while back. And it, what it does, it, it explains how you can rescue the princess by using a different programming language. So every programming language has its traits, its you know, uh, downsides. Uh, and all of those were incorporated in, in this comic. But when it got to PHP, it was like, OK, this knight is giving up. He is unable to save the princess, and he would rather not try. So instead, he, he gives up, and he dies. And this is something that, you know, it was an irritating ending for me, because I've been working with PHP for six years. I've been working on software that's really high scale with teams from all around the world. And you can really scale PHP. And Demin also demonstrated how you can do it yesterday. So it's, it's not that it's impossible to save a princess. So when you think about this, it's more of the approach we have towards programming and not so much the language itself. So while I was preparing for this presentation, I ran onto this uh, research made by HackerRank. And they surveyed developers on various topics. One of those was what they hate most when programming or what they hate most in their daily work. And what they answered was spaghetti code. So I'm sure we can all relate to this, right? It's, it's something that we dread. And whenever we join a legacy system or whenever we join a um, team where you know, we're new and we need to get up and running with everything, it's getting hard because we don't understand what the code does. And we spend much more time reading it and trying to understand it than we do actually developing new features or fixing bugs. Uh, so that's what I will try to, to cover with this talk. I wanted to go through a, a specific example of something I currently work on. And there will be some code, even though it's early in the morning. So I hope you had your coffees. Uh, this is a screenshot of, of the platform uh, for, for Adeva. So basically, it's the login page after the, the developer signs up, they're uh, accepted to our community. So this is where they can access all of the opportunities that, we, that they have and update their profiles. So basically what it does, it's a couple of links on the side and then um, a form where they can edit their profile details, add their experience, and add their education. So when we first started working on this, we were still pretty small. And we could manage everything on, on Slack, so all of the developer communication, all of the opportunities were managed directly. But after a while, since we started growing, we decided we needed a place where everyone could log in and manage everything on their own. So, but we didn't want to spend a lot of time and invest a lot of resources at the beginning in building a large platform. We wanted to do it step by step. And that's how we, how we decided to start. So we were using a third party system for managing uh, all of our applicants. Uh, it's called uh, Zoho Recruit, and it, it's kind of like a CRM for candidates. So you can manage all of their details, attach CVs, and um, edit their experience, their education, history, and all of that. Uh, and it was fine. Our administrators would log in there and manage everything. And here, we wanted to just create a simple form and connect it uh, through uh, the third-party API so that we can save all of the details there. So how this looks in the back, we started 
this was the only page that we needed, so we decided, okay, we'll just create one class and put everything inside that. Uh, this is a candidate class that handles, it's like an adapter on our end that handles all of the API calls. So basically it has um, the, the methods for updating candidate details, their education, their experience, and also several more that are not listed here, but we added them afterwards, like adding notes for the candidate and uh, sending emails, scheduling interviews, so stuff that were more important on, on the admin side. Then this is the part where we actually display this form. It's pretty simple, just makes a connection to that API and then uh, calls of all of the, uh, the needed functions to return the, the data we need. And this is how it's displayed in the view. So why this is important is to notice that we are actually manipulating arrays. So everything we get is used as an array afterwards. Now this is a bit more complex and it's the actual update function, so it's how things work once we cl click the, the update button. And over here we have a bit more messy code, so it has this part which handles the candidate details update, basically gets all of the basic details like name, email, and sends them to, uh, to the system, to the third party system. After that, we have some logic for going through all of the experiences. So you probably noticed that there was a button to add multiple experiences. And it's also an option to delete ones that uh, you're not interested in having in your, in your profile anymore. Uh, so what this does is it goes through all of the uh, experiences that were added, checks if they exist in the system already. And then if they do, it updates them. Otherwise, it adds a new record. And at the end is this delete part where it deletes everything that's not used anymore. And we have a similar logic for the education as well. It's just we change the, the calls and we change the variable names, but it's basically the same. So after completing this, we realized it was a good approach. It worked for us. We had this system on the back end, uh, in the background that we were using for storing everything related to the developers. And we had a nice interface for them to log in and edit all of the details. And once we started uh, moving forward, we decided, OK, we'll add one feature at a time for the admin side as well. So we started with manipulating, uh, managing candidates, adding new candidates, uh, deleting uh, existing ones, qualifying and qualifying them, and everything that's needed, that needed to be done on the admin side, finishing with uh, generating the profiles, sending client proposals. So everything that was related to the developer side, to the developer's data, and we needed for uh, the admin side was slowly getting developed. And over time, it became, became uh, massive. Not that massive, but for this use case, it was, it was really a large code base and uh, very messy code, because we, were, we kept on adding and adding new uh, un, not well-structured code. So after completing all of this, this third-party system wasn't flexible enough for us anymore, so we decided that we needed to switch to a local database. We wanted to have the flexibility of working with everything uh, on our end and then adding new features as we needed. So let's see what it took for us to move to a local database with this code structure. Now I'll be looking uh, again at this larger update uh, method. The first thing is to switch from using the Zoho API for updating the candidate details to using our uh, Nelkan model. So this is a Laravel code, but it's pretty similar no matter what you use. Uh, so basically, we changed the approach. And instead of using this uh, class for calling all of the API methods, we are now using uh, Eloquent models and just using the methods they have for updating things in the database. The second part was uh, to update the experiences. And over here, again, we use the same approach. But instead of using separate model for the experience, we decided to rely on the relation between the candidate and the experience, so uh, that, that part of, of the eloquent models. And the education is pretty much the same, so it replaces with a similar code like this one. Now, if you look at this a little bit closer, we can see all of the changes that we had to make. So this is a pretty simple uh, piece of code. 
uh, but it has several changes that needed to be made. The first one is here where uh, we use a different approach to check if the experience exists. So that's the one change that we need to make here. Uh, we need to use a different approach to update it, and then we need to use, again, a different approach to create one and delete the existing experiences. So it's three different changes and changes of logic, not only changes of uh, certain references, in a simple code snippet, which is several lines long. And if we scale this to the whole system, even if we scale this to the, to the method, we have three more changes like this for the education part. We have two more changes for the candidate details that we saw on the previous slide. And it makes eight changes of code in a single method. So scaling this to the whole system, scaling this to the admin side, would really take a lot of changes to, go, to get from the third party system to using a local database and use the flexibility that this local database would offer. So this is where the solid design principle, principles come. So I'd like to go through this example again but, uh, by using the solid design principles and seeing how they can help us simplify this code and make it much easier to change at a later point. But first, just as a little um, overview again of what the solid design principles are. So the first one is the single responsibility principle, which basically states that every class should have only one responsibility. You shouldn't mix everything in one class like we did with our, our candidate API. You should separate all of the specific responsibilities and specific smaller classes that are responsible for, for each thing. So you might think about this like instead of having a one large class with one generic name, you would have several smaller classes with more specific names and have those names really define what that class is responsible about. The second one is uh, the open-closed principle. Um, this one can be confusing, but it's really very important and can, can help a lot in, in extending systems. Uh, so what it stands for is uh, having a system that's open for extension but closed for modification. And this means that you should be designing your code in a way that allows you to add new features and extend or change existing functionality by adding new code to it instead of modifying what you've already wrote. Because if we keep on modifying what we have, we would never get to a point where our system is tested enough so that it can become stable. We constantly change something, and we constantly need to retest it, right? So it's, it's never at a point where it's resistant to bugs. A good example about using the open closed principle is with uh, open source libraries. So whenever you use uh, a, you install a package with with Composer, you hopefully don't go in the vendor folder and edit everything there and then use it like that. You just add another piece of code on top of it that modifies what you used, what you get from from that package, and it adapts it, it to to your specific need and specific use case. And that's why the open source libraries are so uh, stable, because they, they get tested all the time, and it, they rarely get modified. So this, this is in particular important for the core of your system. Not, not for every part of it, of course, but the core of your system has to be um, resistant to bugs, and you should change it less so that you can get to a point where it's more stable. And the third one is uh, the Liskov substitution principle. And this states that you should always be careful about what a class does before you replace it with another one. And this is not only about uh, the interface that it implements or what methods it has. It's also about what those methods do and what they return or whether they throw an exception or not. When you have a class that returns something and then replace it with another class that returns something else, even though it uses the same method, then your code will eventually break. The fourth one is the interface segregation principle. And this goes closely with the single responsibility one. It's essentially for separating your code in smaller pieces, smaller interfaces, that you will depend on instead of depending on a large class. And why this is helpful uh, about is you would use 
smaller classes or smaller interfaces to handle something in your code. If you depend on a large class, if we always depend on this candidate class, we would depend on the ability to create notes or send emails when we actually just need to unqualify a candidate. So your code is very coupled together, and one change in one area can cause a lot of problems in another area, and that's why you it's very important to, se to separate those interfaces and depend on only things that you need and things that you want to use. And finally, the last one is uh, the dependency inversion principle. This one uh, states that you should always depend on abstractions instead of depending on concrete implementations. And one good example over here is comes from the real world. So when you want to charge your computer at your office or your home, you usually plug it and use a socket to do that. You don't go behind the wall and wire things up so that you can get electricity. You don't care how things are done behind that socket. That's, that's done for you, it, it happens in the background, and you just want to use it. And you use this socket as an interface to get electricity. And this is how your code should behave. It should, it should use what you have in the background and know that it's somewhere, but it doesn't have to know what happens in the background. It doesn't have to wire things up in the background. It just needs to rely on an interface that essentially enables, them, enables it to, to complete a functionality. So if we go back to our code now, uh, let's see how many places we violate this principle. These principles, the five of them. First, we obviously have too many responsibilities here. The first one is the candidate update part. So this thing, again, updates all of the candidate details, sends them to, to the third-party API, and it's a separate responsibility that should be moved away from this controller. The second one is updating the experience. So this, is, this part is, again, responsible for the experiences of the developer, so it should be probably somewhere else where it would be specific specifically um, handling the experiences. The third part is manipulating the education. Similar uh, to the experience part, it has a separate logic, and it's probably better off in another place. And finally, the fourth responsibility, which is what our controller should actually be responsible for, is returning what we have to the client. So controllers are responsible for handling the flow of the application. They, they should get the details from, from the client. They should pass everything to separate uh, entities who, who handle things for it. And then they should return the proper response to the client. They shouldn't care about how everything is handled in the background. So all of these responsibilities, apart from um, the part where we get the request, and that's, that's uh, passed uh, as, a, uh, as a parameter to, the, to this function, so the request is handled separately and it's validated separately so it doesn't mess up this code additionally. Uh, but still, we have three responsibilities that needs to be moved away from here, and then we can ha only handle the, the flow of the application. So it's an obvious violation of single responsibility principle. Now what about extending this code with additional functionality? So right now we have education, we have experience, but at one point we needed to add projects as well. And for the developers, the, the project snippet would be similar. It would need to go through all of the projects, update them, or delete, and, or add, uh, create new ones. So it's essentially a similar code snippet that's added right b uh, before we return the details to our view. And this is modifying this function. It makes it much messier. It, it makes it much larger. And it also has to modify the class, the candidate class that we were relying on, because we had everything handled back there. This violates the open-close principle, because if we keep on changing this, this method whenever we need to add something new to, to this profile, we would really get to a point where, we would never get to a point where everything is stable or we would constantly need to retest everything and fix bugs when, where we don't expect them. And this part over here, so 
we depend on the, uh, the candidate class directly. So we depend on a full class that has all of the methods, which violates the interface segregation principle, because again, we shouldn't rely, we shouldn't uh, depend on something that we don't want to use. But it also violates the dependency inversion principle because we are depending on something concrete. We are trying, our controller is trying to wire things up so it can update the candidate details. It doesn't rely on, on the implementation that we have in the background. And this makes it much more difficult to, to change in the future and to replace it with uh, the, the local database and how we would handle it. Now this edit part, it was pretty simple and short, but it still has some uh, slight issues with it. So again, we depend on this uh, concrete class for the candidate that has everything coupled together. But if we need to change it, it's, it's just a short change. Instead of depending on uh, the third party API, we are again using our eloquent model and we handle everything in two lines. After that, we also need to change our view. So instead of using a separate uh, variable, we are now relying on the relation provided to us by the, by the model. And this should work, right? It's fairly simple, three lines of, of code. It shouldn't break anywhere. But it does. And it breaks at a point where we forgot that we, we were using arrays, and we're now trying to pass it an object of candidate experience. So it violates the list of substitution principle because we weren't really aware of what we're using and how we need to access the data that we have. We just replaced one class with another and we hoped it would work properly. So what did it took to uh, move to a local database? First, we needed to create the models for all of our database tables, which is fine. We would obviously have to do it at some point. Then we, need, uh, we needed to change all of the controller dependencies. So instead of depending on the third party API, we're now depending on these eloquent models and we have to go everywhere in the code and replace them manually. Apart from that, we also need to change the control, controller uh, logic because it needs to rely on the functionality provided by these new models instead of relying on the third party API. And this includes all parts of the system. It includes the developer side where developers can log in and edit their profiles or register. It also involves the admin side where we have uh, management of all of the candidates and then uh, sending proposals, adding profiles or everything else that was coming afterwards. We had to change all the views because we were using an array previously and now we want to use objects and collections. Of course, we need to adapt our unit tests because we changed everything. We obviously need to change them too. And we need to retest all of it as a whole because we introduced so many changes in the system that it will probably break somewhere. And what we estimated for this was actually 30 days, but <laughs> it's probably a, an older version of the presentation with the wrong estimation. Uh, but still, it's something too long uh, to, to take to move from one, uh, one version to another. So it's not something that we wanted to do because still we wanted to go lean and then uh, add things as we, as we moved forward. So we can do better than this. How can we incorporate all of these principles into our code and make it work better and make it easier to extend and, and change in the future? First, we need to separate the responsibilities in specific classes. So instead of relying on one large candidate class, we would now separate everything into candidate experience, candidate education, candidate projects, candidate basic details. So separate all of them uh, in smaller, smaller specific classes that have names which define what the class is responsible about. The second step would be to design the code in a way that allows us to extend it by adding new code instead of changing the existing one. Third, to be aware of the return type. So when we expect an array, we should never send an object. So we, we should think about this upfront and 
use objects since the beginning. We shouldn't depend on concrete implementations. This would make it much easier for us to, to change to the new implementation afterwards. And we shouldn't depend on unnecessary methods. So we shouldn't depend on things we don't use because those things can break code where it's not expected to break. Now, this is the first step. What we do here is actually creating an interface, interfaces for all of the, um, the separate features that we have. We have candidate experience interface, which, handle, which has all of the methods we need to, to execute the update process, all of the processes related to the experience. And then we also have um, candidate education and candidate interfaces, which are collapsed just for the simplicity, but they basically do the, the same thing. And this is where we segregate the interfaces. So this is where we comply to the interface segregation principle, because instead of depending on one huge class, we are now depending on separate interfaces. The second step is to create repositories. So each of these repositories would be the concrete implementation of our interfaces. This is how things will work in the background. This would be the, the, the wiring, and our interfaces would be the sockets. So this class is implement the interface that we, interfaces that we defined, and they comply with the single responsibility principle because they are small and they're specific. Third step would be to create separate classes that would mimic the uh, model classes, which we would be using later. So over here, we, ch we just have a simple class that uh, has methods for returning relationships, like education and experience, in order to not have to create, uh, use separate variables and then change them with the relationships. So this is where we think about the substitutions and we think about what our classes do and what their methods actually return so that we can know how to replace them at a later point. And this is how our update function looks like. So we got from f over 50 lines of code to a code of four lines where everything is delegated to separate, separate methods and separate classes. And you will notice that this code is much more readable. It's much easier to understand. If you need to see how you manage the experiences, you would probably find the implementation of the candidate experience and see what's done over there. If you don't need it, then you, you don't need to read through unnecessary code in order to get to the point where you need to change something. So you will notice here that we depend on the interface instead of the actual repositories. And this is where we do the dependency inversion. So we depend on abstractions. And with this, we would be able to just change the implementation in the background by adding new repositories, and everything would work. We would not need to go through all of our code and all of our controllers to, to replace the dependencies. We would just need to add new, um, add new files, new classes, and everything would work. And that's the open-close principle. We extend by adding new code instead of modifying the existing one. At that point, our uh, code would get tested well enough, and it would get much more stable than it would if we were just going back and changing everything all the time. There is one change that we need to do, and that's uh, where we bind the actual implementations to the, uh, to the interfaces. And it's just a three lines change. So instead of depending on our third-party API, we're now depending on the new repositories. And that's it. That's all we need to change in our code to make it work with the local database. So let's see how this worked out. Again, we had to create uh, eloquent models for the new database tables. <coughs> we had to create repositories now that uh, work with the local database, because our new structure requires repositories to handle everything. We had to write unit tests for the new classes, but only for them, because everything else works out of the box. And we need to bind the repository, so that change that we need to, to make, just make sure that when we rely on the interface, it uses the, repositories, the repository that we need. And that's it. And with this, we estimated five days. And you might think it's 
too big of a difference and it's too unrealistic. But essentially, we are relying on 10 methods or 12 methods from the third-party API. We don't have too many methods that we rely on. The problem is that we are using those same methods over and over again in our code. And then when we need to change something, we need to go inside our code and change, change it everywhere. If we, if we were using this approach where we rely on the solid design principles, we would just need to go in our repository, write 12 new methods in all of our specific classes, and that would be it. So it's been a long overview, but to sum it all up, what does it take to become better developers? The first thing to do is to incorporate thoughtful programming. So you should always care about what you're working on. You should always think about what's the best solution for your problem instead of what's the easiest solution to it. You need to think about the bigger picture, talk to other people, try to understand what your task requires. It's not just a story that's on Jira or whatever you're using for managing the project. It's something more and it's something that's related to the business logic of the, of the application that you're building. And if you understand what you're working on, you would be able to understand how to implement it better. You would be able to write code that would be extendable and easy to maintain on the long run. The second one is to think about the UX of your code. And this is developer experience in our case. So the users of our code are other developers. Or we are the users of our code. And you should be thinking about writing code that another developer would like to, to continue working on. You should write code that other team members would like to hop on and continue working on it with you. Or you would be able to go back to something that you've been working on a year ago and know what you actually did there, because your code is well structured and it's readable and understandable. So always think about, even if you're not using the solid design principle, principles, always think about uh, writing code that's easy to read and easy to understand. We talked about this a while. Uh, so using the solid design principles, you can write code that's easy to maintain, easy to extend, and easy to change on the long run. But it, it's not the rule. So it always depends on your use case, and it always depends on what you need to do, how complex your code is, and whether or not it should be extended or changed in the future. So think about it, use common sense, think about your trade-offs, whether you should spend more time structuring your code and writing better architecture upfront, or that's unnecessary, because Solid takes a bit more time writing code at the beginning, so it can get easier in, uh, on the long run to change it and to, to extend it. So it's your tool. It's not your goal. So you should never try to achieve solid as a goal. You should use it as other principles to achieve code that's easier to work with and that would make your lives easier. And finally, please don't laugh on PHP jokes. Let's show everyone that we're a really nice community and we can build a lot of cool stuff with PHP. Thank you. <laughs>